Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is David Rowe. I'm the Director of Digital Matters and Associate Professor of English. Uh, today, we're going to have a workshop led by Justin Sorensen. But before we get into that and I give my introduction to him, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, the Tanner Humanities Center and the College of Humanities is hosting Ruha Benjamin, a, an Associate Professor of African American Studies, who will be here virtually on October 15th, giving a talk on her book, Race After Technology. Uh, we have obviously have some overlapping interests with this uh, event, so I encourage you to check that out. Second thing is that we have a new media studies reading group where we uh, select a book on a digital humanities subject broadly conceived and we read it and then we discuss it afterwards. Uh, we put out an announcement where we will uh, give you away, we'll give away free books for those who are interested in participating. Uh, so please, if you're interested in participating in that, sign up uh, through our listserv or email Marissa. Marissa, if you can add your email to the chat box, that'd be great. Um, and lastly, we have a series of faculty grants and graduate fellowships uh, you probably have heard of already. The deadline is tomorrow by midnight. Uh, Marissa will add the links to the chat box as well. Um, and I just want to make stress that there are uh, several different uh, grant program. So there's the faculty grant and then there's an exhibition slash performance grant and then there's a graduate fellowship and it's a exhibition slash performance graduate grant. So please make sure to read up on the differences between them. Okay, uh, Justin Sorensen is a GIS specialist in the Department of Creativity and Innovation Services here at the Marriott Library. Uh, some of his GIS projects include reconstructing the past through Utah Sanborn fire insurance maps and the historical GIS of Salt Lake City, an interactive geospatial study of historical, environmental, and health-related impacts to Salt Lake City. And today, he's going to give us a very gentle crash course on GIS. All right, um, let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Is it look okay? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's virtual workshop titled Digital to Physical, Using GIS Technology to Create 3D Topographic Models. Uh, my name is Justin Sorensen. I'm the GIS Specialist at the J. Willard Marriott Library. Um, during my time working within the GIS industry, one of the things that I've enjoyed most is utilizing the power of GIS technology to take data sets to an entirely new level. And that's what I'll be demonstrating for you today. In this workshop, I'm going to be introducing you to an in-house process that we've developed for converting elevation data into 3D models for printing and analysis. Uh, I'll also be introducing you to a new project that is in the development stages at the Marriott Library that allows us to take geospatial data sets and project them onto printed topographic models. So um, if you have any questions about the processes that I'll be covering today, I'm happy to answer those for you at the end of this workshop. Uh, I'll also be sharing some detailed handouts at that time um, so that you too can create and print 3D topographic models of areas around the world. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump right into this workshop. To start things off, I'd briefly like to introduce you to what GIS is and why it's so important in our world today. GIS is used in many aspects of our lives, whether we realize it or not. Um, and really, it makes a lot of the modern conveniences of life possible. Now, this can range from something as large as monitoring and implementing plans related to vegetation change over time, or something more simple that many of us do on a daily basis, using our phones to find and navigate to locations around town. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, or in some recent trends, people refer to it as Geospatial Information Systems. And this represents a number of different geospatial technologies, software, processes, and methods for visualizing different types of data within a geospatial context. Generally, this type of data is presented in the form of cartographic maps, 
interactive mapping applications, and geospatial infographics. But at its core, GIS allows for the visualization, analysis, and interpretation of data in order to understand relationships, patterns, and trends in data. The way that this is accomplished is through the incorporation of multiple layers, which when brought together creates a geospatial visualization that expresses and enhances data by incorporating visual resources. Now, these layers can include things such as imagery, including satellite and aerial photographs, elevation data sets, such as contour lines and elevation models, demographic data sets, such as census information, transportation data sets, including street networks and railways, address information, including geocoded and plotted locations, physical features, including boundaries, hydrology, and survey control points, as well as research data that is collected that an individual may wish to share with their viewers. Bringing this information together provides not only an educational experience, but also a method for researchers and viewers to answer questions, relay findings, and identify solutions that previously may have been unconsidered. In today's workshop, we'll be focusing on one particular type of GIS data that can be utilized to create 3D topographic models. This type of data is known as digital elevation models, or DEM, as I'll be referring to it throughout this workshop. The DEM is a data set that contains elevation data representing the surface or terrain of the Earth that also has this unique ability of being expressed three-dimensionally when the appropriate tools and procedures are applied. Now, the level of detail that's contained within these data sets can depend on the resource that you acquire it from. So to begin, I'd like to introduce you to a free, openly available resource for acquiring high-quality DEM data sets that can be used to produce a 3D model. The resource we'll be utilizing for acquiring DEM data sets in this workshop is called the National Map Viewer an online resource provided by the United States Geological Survey, or GUGS, that contains a wide variety of products related to the United States. For this workshop, we're going to be focusing on a single feature found within the United States. But should you be interested in features found outside the United States, Earth Explorer is another online resource provided by UGS that is a great resource for acquiring such data sets. When the National Map Viewer is first launched, you'll see that I'm presented with an overview map of the United States, along with a selection of available data set options to the left. To identify available DEM data sets for my project, I begin by selecting Elevation Products 3 DEP within the selection window. And I narrow the selection down so that it returns results, um, in this case, for a one-third arc second DEM interval. Now you're probably wondering what a one-third DEM, one-third arc second DEM is. Basically, in a geospatial perspective, one-third data set translates to a model that has elevation changes of 10 meters. So each layer of the model represents 10 meters. Um, this is one of the highest quality and most commonly available DEM data sets that are available throughout the United States. When you begin working with areas outside the United States, that turns into a one arc second data set, and that's more of elevation changes of 30 meters. So um, it's slightly less detailed than the 10 meter data set I'll be working with today, but it still contains a lot of valuable and useful information for creating 3D models. I begin my search by identifying a single location or feature on the map that I can obtain a DEM data set for. For today's workshop, I'll be showing you how to create a 3D model of Mount Rainier, located in the state of Washington. I begin by inputting this information into the search box, which navigates me to the location on the map. In the new pop-up box, I select Find Products to display all of the available data sets matching my search criteria. In this case, a single item is returned containing a one-third arc second, or a 10-meter DEM data set representing the area of Mount Rainier. Selecting the footprint option provides a preview of the extent that the data set covers on the map and also allows me to verify that the data set will include information on the feature or area of my focus. 
Some additional options that are available include selecting the thumbnail option to preview how the DEM data set will appear when it is opened, as well as the download option to save the data set to a project folder on my computer. Now, a tip that I do recommend when you begin generating models from these DEM data sets is to create a new project folder for each project you're developing. Doing so helps to avoid any problems with future projects that may utilize the same data set. Once the DEM has been downloaded to my project folder, I can unzip the file and I'm ready to take the first step towards developing my 3D model. This is an example of what the DEM data set looks like. It's a geotiff image containing the image, elevation information, and location information for automatically overlaying in the correct location within a GIS mapping program. The next step in creating a 3D topographic model from a DEM data set is to clip the original downloaded DEM into a specified area, shape, or extent. Now, this step is completely optional and you can proceed forward with printing the entire downloaded DEM but you will find that when printing such a large extent, physical details are less visible. So I do recommend that you proceed with this process and refine the model into a more focused, detailed, and presentable model of a specific area or feature. So in this example, I'll be clipping the DEM to contain only data surrounding the immediate extent of Mount Rainier, which as you can see is a very small portion of this downloaded data set. To perform this process, you will need access to a version of ArcGIS software, either ArcMap or ArcPro, which is the version that I'll be using for this example. Access to both of these software programs is available on Patriot computers located at the Marriott Libraries Knowledge Commons, University of Utah Computing Labs, and remotely through the CSBS Virtual Lab using your unit name and password. As the DEM contains no references to distinguish individual features from, I begin by selecting an appropriate base map for this project. Now I recommend choosing either an imagery with labels base map or a general topographic base map, as these will assist in identifying specific areas and features that are found on the map. With the reference base map in place, I bring the downloaded DEM into ArcGIS Pro using the Add Data tool within the Map Tools ribbon at the top of the screen, and navigating to the file within my project folder. As you can see, once the DEM is added to ArcGIS Pro, it automatically, over, it automatically overlays in its appropriate location on the map, and also becomes a selectable layer within the table of contents located on the left side of the screen. I also have the option to zoom into the layer should it not do so automatically by right clicking on the layer within the table of contents and selecting zoom to layer. I then want to adjust the transparency of the DEM layer in order to see both the physical features and references found in the base map as well as the DEM itself by going to the appearance ribbon at the top of the screen and adjusting the transparency slider so that both the base map and DEM are viewable simultaneously. And generally what I found is a good reference for this is around 30 to 40%. So I'm putting 30% on this example here. Viewing the area directly above the downloaded DEM, I use reference information contained within the base map to identify the area representing Mount Rainier and zoom in for a closer, air, closer view by hovering over the feature and using the mouse wheel to zoom in. I'm now ready to create a shape that represents the extent of Mount Rainier for my model. To do this, I begin by creating a feature class that will be used to create a boundary for the DEM features to be clipped. The boundary itself can be anything as simple as a circle surrounding the feature, which is what I'll be demonstrating next, to something a bit more complex like a county or state boundary. I begin by going to the catalog panel located on the right side of the screen navigating to my project folder and right clicking on the associated geodatabase folder and selecting new and feature class. Using the feature class tool, <clears throat> sorry, using the feature class tool, I input information to create a polygon representing the boundary shape. Since I'm only creating a single feature for clipping, there's no need to create large amounts of attribute data for the data set. 
So I can select OK and complete this process, where I can drag and drop this new feature class into the table of contents panel that I just created. <clears throat> to create the boundary feature itself, I highlight the feature class layer that I just created within the table of contents. And within the edit ribbon at the top of the screen, I select create features. I want to create a basic shape surrounding Mount Rainier. So I select the circle option within the sidebar and select the tool itself within the mapping window. Left clicking on the center of Mount Rainier, I drag the circle outward to my desired extent. Left clicking again to complete the shape. Back in the edit ribbon at the top of the screen, I select save edits and the new boundary shape is ready to be used the DEN data set. With this boundary layer in place, I'll now click the DEM to export only features representing Mount Rainier contained within that circle. To do this, I go to the analysis ribbon at the top of the screen and select tools. In the new search window, I search for the clip raster tool and select it from the available options. Within the new processing tool window, I input the DEM layer as a layer to be clipped the feature class layer as the boundary to clip features within. I name the new DM file and select both extent boxes, then choose run. When the process is completed, you'll see that a new clip DEM has been created containing only data representing Mount Rainier within the boundary circle. It is this new clip data set that will be used to generate the detailed 3D model of Mount Rainier for printing and analysis. With this export process completed, I can close ArcGIS Pro and move forward to the next step. And that next step in the 3D topographic model process is to convert the clip DEM data set into an actual 3D model or an SDL file that will be used to generate the final model. To do this, you'll need access to a program called QGIS, a free openly available software program available for download from the QGIS website. Now, unlike ArcGIS Pro, QGIS has one particular tool that was missing for generating a 3D model called DEM 3D printing. I begin the process by opening QGIS, navigating to the new Clip DEM dataset, and adding it to my QGIS project. In the raster menu at the top of the screen, I select DEM to 3D and choose DEM 3D printing. In the new processing tool window, I'll input the size and layer information that will be used to generate the 3D model. For this process, I'll apply the following information based on specifications for the Marriott Library's TAS 6 printers. For extent, I select print full extent. And what this means is that I want to print the entire extent of my clip model, as you can see with this red dash border surrounding the model. So I know that this full area is what will be printed. For print spacing or how thick I want each layer to be, I want these to be on the thinner slide. So I'll select 0.2 millimeters. But depending on the detail and the type of model you're working with, I sometimes even reduce this further to 0.15 or 0.41 millimeters. For dimensions, I want my model to be the maximum size of the print bed. So for the TAS 6 printers, this is about 11 inches or 279.4 millimeters. Uh, but other printers available at the Marriott Library, such as the Gigabot printer, uh, can print up to a maximum of 24 inches or 609.6 millimeters. For the exaggeration field, I want to make sure to emphasize peaks that are found in my model. So I'll increase this to anywhere from 1.2 to 1.5, but I have found that anything above 1.5 will distort the features and won't present an accurate representation of what's found in the real world. Finally, for height, I input the lowest point indicated in the provided elevation data to the right. From here, I select export to SDL, making sure to maintain the default file name for the export. The reason that I may, sorry, the reason that I say to maintain that default file name is that this avoids a common error that causes the model export process to fail. But after the process is completed, you can go back and rename the file name afterwards. Now, depending on the file size, the size of your model output and the processing power of your computer, this process can take some time to complete. But once completed, you can open the new model file in a preview program, such as Print3D that's found on the Windows platform, 
make sure that everything looks good before closing QGIS. And what you're seeing on screen now is just an example of what that exported model looks like within Print 3D. Um, gives you a good idea of how the model looks, if you can see any features that you want to change before you move on in the process, and just a good overview of the model itself. Now, with the 3D model now generated, we're, ready, we're really in the home stretch. Um, I'll now use an additional program to convert the 3D model from its SDL file into a code that the 3D printer will use to print the final model. Now, there are many programs available to perform this process, but the one that I'll be using for this workshop is called Prusa Slicer. It's another free and openly available program that you can find and download from their website. This program, along with another program called Cura, are also available on dedicated model slicing machines, um, computers located in the protospace area of level two at the Marriott Library. Uh, those machines also pr are preset with information on the available 3D printers that are found in the same space. So for this process, I'll go into Slicer and begin adding the X by exporting the I'll begin by adding the exported 3D model that I created in the previous step. Utilizing the available tools within Slicer, I can apply changes to the final model, including adjustments to the overall scale, removal of additional material that was generated during the export process, and other features that are available as well. In this example, I am actually removing the square border that is surrounding the model so that the final output contains a circular model representation of Mount Rainier. Once I'm satisfied with the appearance of the final model, I select the Slice Now tool to begin generating the layers of the model to be printed. Now this process is very interesting as it provides an interactive preview of each layer of the printed model and an overall understanding of how the printing process will proceed. Once the slicing process is completed, I select export G-code and save the file to my project folder. It's this G-code file that will be loaded onto the 3D printer and used to create a printed model of Mount Rainier. After reviewing the returned information on size, print time, and print filament requirements, I can close Slicer and move on to printing my 3D topographic model. So we have the G-code, the final model is ready to go. We're now ready to begin the 3D print. The printing process can be as simple as finding a 3D printer, such as those located in protospace, loading the exported G-code onto the printer's SD card, loading some printing filament onto the printer itself, and selecting print. What you end up with is something like this, a detailed model of Mount Rainier created using the processes covered in today's workshop and printed on a machine located at the Marriott Library. The Marriott Library has a number of, of 3D printers available for use by students, staff, and faculty at the University of Utah with expert staff on hand to assist and answer questions. Pictures of the model in the slides, and actually I'm gonna hold it up for you, the actual model itself that you're seeing through my webcam, um, really don't do it justice um, unless you see it in person. But as you can see in these images and what I'm holding here, the model itself really is quite detailed and provides a very good representation of how Mount Rainier is found within the real world. So, and no, it's, it's pretty light, easy to work with, so. <laughs> now, as you begin developing your own 3D topographic models, it's important to know that experts at the Marriott Library are available to support the development of your project and assist with questions that you have along the way. Should you require assistance generating topographic models, I'm happy to help provide a one-on-one -on -one consultation to support and help you understand the model generation process or resolve any issues you experience in its development. And those consultations can be scheduled by visiting the GIS services website. Uh, additionally, our expert staff in 3D printing services are available to assist with the model slicing process and any issues experienced using the 3D printers. Uh, additional information about those available printers and details for performing a 3D print can be found on their webpage. And I would also recommend visiting that page as well for any changes that may have been implemented at this time due to COVID. <clears throat> 
So as you've seen today, DEM data sets are extremely useful for creating 3D topographic models of features found around the world. But the process of simply printing and examining these models is just the beginning. I'd now like to introduce you to a new project in development at the Marriott Library. The idea for this project started simple. How can we combine the power of GIS technology with 3D printing? The important role that GIS plays has the ability to be taken to a new level, projecting various geospatial data sets directly onto printed 3D models. Stage one of the projection concept began in 2018. We began with simplified 3D topographic prints. Now these were strictly for test purposes and we knew based on the quality output that we received that high quality data would be needed should the project progress to a new level. In these images, you can see the results of our initial testings and the efforts to project GIS data from Google Maps onto the model held portable projector. While simplistic in its approach, the results proved that the possibility for projecting data onto the models was there um, and that the project had great potential if taken to the next level. Stage two of the projection concept began in 2019. The process for acquiring, exporting, and converting DEM data sets into customized 3D models was refined with larger, highly detailed models being created. In this example, you can see the large scale wall mounted model of Salt Lake County printed at almost two feet wide with silver filament. The stage two projection concept utilizes a mobile projection unit with various static images of data continuously projected on the Raspberry Pi computer. And this is an example of that slideshow in action. It's Justin, I think we lost you. Oh. Looks like he dropped out. Oh, there he is. Are you back? Justin? Yeah, he's frozen. Bear with us, folks. Hopefully he's back online soon. Justin, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can now. We're, you're cutting out. Uh, I think your connection is pretty unstable. Justin, uh, while we're, while we're wait, oh, sorry. Go while ahead. we're waiting, um, if Justin handed you you or Marissa this handouts, why don't, why don't we pass that out to the participants? Marissa, do you have those? I don't think I have Justin's handouts. Um, no, he's, he said that he was going to distribute them afterwards. Okay. Off. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, no, we can. You can you hear are? me okay? I'm, I'm sorry, it looks like I, I was booted off. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> You, you can hear me okay? Yeah, let's give it another go. Okay, I apologize for that. <laughs> so um, what I was mentioning is that you can see the various layers projected onto the model while it's in action. Um, we brought different things based on like elevation, census information, demographics, information like that. So it's really interesting what you can do by projecting that data. For the, um, oh, I'm sorry. And then here's some additional images. So you can see a side angle of the Salt Lake County model, the different details of the different canyons, the topology going on. But then the image to the right, you can see just how well the data that we're collecting with the GIS is projecting directly onto the model. So it lines very well overall. For the uh, next stage of the project, con the projection concept, 
Uh, further develop and fine tuned project is in development. Uh, currently, I've generated scale models of all 29 Utah counties and submitted them to expert, um, our expert 3D printing services team for large scale printing. Uh, when it's complete, a large topographic model of Utah with individually interconnected county tiles will be on display in the Marriott Library, uh, approximately five feet by four feet in size. A high quality 4K projector will be installed either on a stand or from the ceiling and project interactive GIS data sets onto the large scale model controlled by a tablet or a computer system that patrons will have the ability to incorporate their own data sets on. Now, as the project is in development, it's unknown exactly when it will be deployed. So I do recommend staying tuned to the Merit Library's website, uh, blog posts, and the GIS Services webpage for more information on that as it becomes available. Um, with that, I would like to conclude this workshop by thanking each of you for taking time to join us today and for your interest in learning more about the 3D topographic model um, project and services we're working on at the library. Um, I hope the workshop is helpful in providing information for developing your own 3D topographic projects and ideas for applying these processes to projects you're developing on your own. Uh, again, should you need assistance with developing a model or creating a 3D print, please feel free to reach out to me in GIS services or a member of our 3D printing services team uh, with any questions that you have. Um, with that, I will go ahead and upload the handouts for this workshop to the chat window. Let me go ahead and do that now. Um, so while just okay. as doing that, we have time for some questions. Um, and I think if you want to just type in your questions, Rebecca will moderate. <laughs> Uh, but also, if you'd like to just uh, ask, please raise your hand either visually or with the emoticons. I'll start. Justin, I, I was trying to look for the DEM data in the USGS Government website. I'm, I'm assuming you have it on the, the handout, but do, mm -hmm. what, what, how, what, what would I search for? Because it's a very large website and quite complicated. Yeah. So. Um, in section two of the handouts that I'm providing, it tells you um, what particular data set you want to be looking under. In this case, you're looking for that elevation product 3DEP. That's what the actual file or folder that it's contained under is called. And from there, you just narrow it down, selecting the one third arc second. And that's the best high quality data that they offer at this time. So, and right, so you, that you have most highly detailed. I'm sorry, what? You have a link on the, the handout? Yeah, there's a link on the handout as well. And when I was mentioning earlier about one third arc second being the most high quality throughout the United States, there are some areas like, I think I believe in Salt Lake area, you can get a two meter data set, but it's just not high available, you know, throughout the entire nation. So one third is that available nationwide that you want to work with. <laughs> so we have a question in the chat. Actually, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, Justin, the first one is, could you speak more to some of the applications you encountered of DEM models? How has it been used in teaching, for example? Okay. Um, you know, just a lot of them I've seen using for like elevation, slope analysis, um, you know, different fields use it for different types of information. This has been the major use that I've used it for so far is to use these models to create um, to be able to analyze different slopes, different areas around the world. Um, not really sure how others are being used or specifically in teaching, but my hope is that, you know, with the projection system we're working on developing, that this would be a, a use for that in a teaching environment. People would be able to bring their data in, project it onto models and see it actually in action. So having hands-on component as well. Our next question is, uh, perhaps I missed you talking about this, but I'm interested to know what colors you tested for the 3D models to be projected on, what the various results were, and why you settled on dark gray instead of the original white. It's a good question. Um, we, the initial um, test was actually on red, and 
let's just say red doesn't work very well for 3D topo models. Um, re, uh, white, actually, in this model that we're looking at here, it works well, especially for projection, but the kind of issue with it, when you're looking at it from the side and stuff, it's hard to see all the different you know, features, the details of the terrain that's going on here. Um, silver was a very good compromise for both of them. It allowed for the projection that it didn't overshadow anything. You could see the different angles and shadows of the different terrains taking place on here. And even when it wasn't projected, it was a good reference model for working with that. So um, white does work well, but silver just seemed to stand out a lot more and catch people's attention as well. So. Okay, thanks. Um, our next question, um, I'd be curious what problems you ran into during this project and also the problems that amateurs might run into when using this data and building a model. Uh, one of the biggest problems we ran into was in the export process. We initially tried to bypass ArcGIS Pro completely, just doing like the clip analysis within QGIS. And for some reason or another, that program just does not want to cooperate with this. So that's why I highly suggest using ArcGIS Pro to do clipping and stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of another thing um, running into a problem is having to use multiple programs to create these models. Ideally, I would like to see us just use ArcGIS Pro and then go right to Slicer. Um, I attended a GIS conference, a virtual one over the summer where I actually was able to speak with people in charge at Esri who created the ArcGIS program. And I talked to them about this saying, you know, we, we'd really like to see this, a DEM export that we can create our 3D models from. So it's on their list, but unfortunately it's not available in the current release. So. <laughs> um, but in, also in terms of what um, you mentioned amateurs might run into, I think it's just learning the process, these steps in GIS, which the handouts really outline step by step. So once you start mastering these processes, you learn about the tools that you need to use. It just helps you move forward and then you can start incorporating more things as you go down the road. We have another question. Uh, Justin, do you find that you lose detail when printing larger areas, such as a state instead of a single mountain? Absolutely. So. I mean, we're looking at, with the Mount Rainier, this is probably, I'm gonna say that's maybe five miles. I'm not really sure how far we did that. But when you do a similar model that's the same size as this Mount Rainier, for instance, we printed Salt Lake County at that same size. You can see the different um, features like Little Cottonwood, Big Cottonwood Canyon, but you can't really get an idea of the actual mountains themselves. So like if you were to look at Mount Olympus down at the base of the canyon or something like that, it, you can tell there's a peak there, but you can't get all those different features like you'd be getting in a large scale. So yeah, um, it really just depends though on what your project concept is. If you're looking to do something statewide and you're not worried about, you know, really fine tuned representation of a mountain, you know, Larger area works well, but for something like this, you know, you definitely want to increase that and focus on something very specific. Okay, I think we have another question in the chat box. Mm. Anyone else have any questions? I don't see any in here that we've missed unless there was one higher up. Oh, my mistake. Justin, I have a question. Does anyone ever try to create their own data set that they would then use for GIS projects or is it always using data that a government or someone else has, has already collected? I haven't seen anybody try to create like DEM data sets or anything like that, but one of the things we do at GI services is people come in, they have research data they want to create. So maybe plotting locations on a map or features like streams or old road networks or something that doesn't exist. So that's the kind of things that they can come in and get help with creating as well. So, you know, it's kind of a, yeah, it's just really project based really. But yeah, that's been kind of my experience with people working with at the university. Is what about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, just what, what about non uh, natural data sets? Are there like uh, DEM data sets for cities? Um, 
So like getting like right down to the like street level data and stuff, buildings and stuff, is that what you're doing? Yeah, because of that nature. Yeah. There is a possibility to do that. One of the things that we were working on testing before COVID hit was working with LIDAR data so we could actually see, you know, an actual representation of the, like university campus, what we were looking at to see how the buildings would rise in the model and stuff. And there definitely is a good possibility for that. So as long as the data exists, um, it's definitely possible to create stuff like that. So. <laughs> but there's nothing out there already where you can just download the data, like with USGS. Um, for more specific data like that with LIDAR stuff you're looking at, I mean, the data is out there. Some of it is public domain and accessible. Others you're paying to have it done because people go through these processes to create it and are willing to sell it for a subscription, something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I always feel that if you can learn the process, the tools to use this and create it yourself, even the better, so. <laughs> I think we have another new question that came in. Uh, I work with high school students interested in GIS. Is this something that they can access in the library even though they're not U of U students? If not, do you know of, of any programs or resources that they can access? Okay. Um, I believe they're referring to accessing the ArcGIS software within the library. Um, I believe you could just come up to the library and use that. You'd probably want to get like a visitor pass. Um, again, check with um, like the library status right now for how we're allowing access to the library under our current restrictions. Um, but, um, you know, there may be ways to also acquire, you, say you work for a high school or working with high school students, maybe there's an educational license that Esri could apply and allow you to use ArcGIS within those settings as well. So, so Kenny, I'll Once add to the answer um, just by saying that in, in normal times, in non-coronavirus times, we do welcome um, anyone to come into the library and ask questions and use a lot of our resources. Uh, during coronavirus, because we're trying to employ social distancing and keep you know, foot traffic to a minimum, right now you do have to have a U card to enter the library. Um, and then Justin, I'm not sure if you kind of operate this way as well, but for me, when I was doing research data management services, I could help community patrons if they had questions about data. I just had to prioritize faculty and student projects. But then if I had bandwidth, I could help community members. So maybe do you operate that same way with GIS where you have to prioritize faculty and students, but then are able to help community patrons? Like high school oh, absolutely. students? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with fact, kind of the way GIS services works, just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, you know, we have a lot of faculty professors coming and working on research projects. So we give them a lot of hands-on development. Um, students and, um, you know, graduate, undergraduate students come in, we help them. They're working on projects in, you know, they need just assistance, understanding processes that they're learning in class and stuff like that. Um, but I have worked with um, community patrons as well, kind of giving them insight onto projects, what's possible and stuff like that, so. We have a comment in the chat box as well um, that says, um, I feel this could be very helpful for social cartography and field work, especially to work with rural communities. And just thank you. We've seen a couple thank yous come through Justin also. Awesome. <laughs> that comment though about doing field work in rural communities, but. That's there. Oh, and I, I like that comment right there. Esri has a bundle for schools, so that's excellent to know. So. Well, I think we're at time. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm sure Justin, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat box, people will email you directly. Uh, and if yeah, you have I, I can notes. put it in the chat box, and it's also um, on the handouts themselves. Um, so yeah, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Happy I'm sorry, did you already upload the handouts? Uh, yeah, I did. I can upload it again if it's not okay. on there. They're in the chat box if you scroll up, but I also think um, Marissa will probably distribute them to the Digital Matters listserv with a link to this recording. And if you're not on the Digital Matters listserv, please do let us know and we'd love to add you to that so you're always uh, aware of what events are coming up. And Justin just added it again, so it's at the bottom now. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Justin, for the great workshop. Thanks for leading. And thanks, Rebecca, for moderating. And thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs>